Hello, welcome back to my Abbey Offenses. It's glad I'm glad to be here back with Dr. Vladimir Silva. You can see him right here. Apologies for being a little bit late, but we are here and we are ready to answer all of your questions. Well, definitely Vladimir Silva is ready to answer your questions. I'm glad to be back here and we are going to discuss an important topic. What is the role of endometrium in repeated implantation failure? And of course, we will start with the presentation. But after that, there will be time for your questions. And Vladimir is here to help you with that. Hello, hi, Vladimir. Glad to see you here. Uh, welcome hi. back. Uh, last care. time you've been here, it was still a, a year, I mean, not a year ago, but of course last, last year. year. <laughs> so uh, we are starting again and I'm glad to have you back. How how are you? Hope you are ready to educate us a bit. Well, hi, Carolina. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm sorry, everyone, for being light. Uh, I was really stuck in traffic. I know that it seems like the oldest <laughs> excuse in the world, but that's exactly what happened with me. Um, but, well, now I'm here. I'm very happy to talk about this topic. Uh, actually, in the past, we've, we've addressed uh, this topic in other webinars, maybe not in a dedicated way. But uh, so let's go over everything we have here and then we can have a little conversation at the end you can ask your questions i'll be very happy to answer everyone uh, i don't sure, know if sure. you can see my screen not yet let's uh, okay. try again there i okay no apparently uh, you are should be seeing my screen right right now we can see your screen not your presentation yet ah, okay 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 so here's the presentation uh, you can see it right yes okay perfect. so it's working start. perfect now let's go ahead. okay so uh once again uh, thanks for being here uh, listening to us uh, today we're going to talk about the the role of the endometrium in repeated implantation failure cases my name is vladimir silva i come from ferti centro ferti centro is a clinic uh, in Portugal, in a town called Coimbra, in the center of Portugal. Uh, it's always a, pl a pleasure to be here. I have to thank the European Fertility Society for the invitation. Uh, we've done quite a few webinars so uh, on this and other topics, so let's start. Um, the first thing that, uh, while looking at this title, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously, what is this, okay? What's the, a recurrent implantation failure? What's the definition of it? Well, actually, there's not much consensus on the scientific community of what should be considered as a recurrent implantation failure, but normally we refer it to it as the failure to achieve a pregnancy after at least three embryo transfers with good quality embryos, or maybe uh, after the transfer are three or four nice blastocysts. What does this mean? It means that First, we talk about this when we are always talking about the same strategy. For example, uh, if you are trying with your own eggs and you're getting great blastocysts, you transfer three or four of them and you're still not getting a pregnancy. So you can talk about uh, recurrent implantation failure, but obviously if you are, say, 40. 3, 44 years old, and um, your embryos are not, are not that good, then uh, missing a not having a pregnancy after three or four blastocysts, uh, it's unfortunately more likely to happen um, than the opposite. And so we cannot talk about recurring in implantation failure. The same with egg donation. You can even be 48 or 49, and you're trying with egg donation with three brilliant embryos uh, and you don't get a pregnancy, then you can talk about recurring implantation failure. So it's a little bit, uh, we need to go case by case, but essentially is this. Following the same, same strategy, three attempts or at least uh, a sensible number of nice good blastocysts, which means uh, very good looking embryos. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, some people argue that uh, this is really just bad luck because obviously when we are doing these treatments, we know that two per persons uh, age 25, if they try naturally, we as humans are not a very fertile species. So a man and a woman at the age of 25, if they try to get pregnant naturally, if they have perfect health without any uh, reproductive issues or any other concerns, they just 
have a 25 to 30 percent pregnancy rate in the natural way every month. Uh, and, and obviously in IVF, uh, for example, when we are doing egg donation, we are just very above that. For example, uh, we can easily get to a 60 percent pregnancy rate or a 70 percent pregnancy rate with egg donation. But obviously statistics are what they are and they can deceive us. For example, if we have uh, 60, this is to show you how numbers can be played. For example, if we have a 60% pregnancy rate, which is kind of the standard for egg donation, and we try, this means that if we transfer an embryo to 100 patients, 60 of them will become pregnant, obviously. 40 will not become pregnant. We go to the remaining 40 and uh, transfer another embryo, and so 24 will get pregnant, 16 will not be pregnant, and if we go to the 16, and, uh, and transfer a third embryo, nine will be pregnant, seven will not be pregnant. So after these three uh, embryos, we can say that we had a 93% accumulated pregnancy rate, but in reality, it was always 60%. So statistics depend a lot on the way that we look at them, okay? And, um, and it's not, uh, so we should be careful. We can't, uh, uh, we can't make uh, overall assumptions um, it's really important when we talk about repeated implantation failure to know what we're talking about. Very important. We, we need to make sure that there are no confounding factors, meaning if the embryos are really good, if the, if the endometrium, which is the tissue inside the uterus, is also good, then uh, we might need to take a deeper look into it. If those conditions are not assured, maybe we're just uh, on the wrong side of statistics and but we, so we need to be careful not to believe in the 93 or not, uh, but always have in mind that it's only 60, okay? Uh, so 60, it's uh, every 10, four uh, don't work, six work. So it's uh, relatively low odds. And, um, but because the reality is that uh, treatments, IVF treatments fail, and many times we don't know why. For example, there was this study published a few years ago in, in Human Reproduction Update, which is one of the main scientific uh, journals in the, um, in the IVF world. This is the official the journal of the European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology, the ESHRE, where these researchers have concluded that uh, in typically, normally, when patients, when patient, patients are not getting pregnant, they often come to the clinic and say, why, why did it happen? Why is it not working for me? And so, um, was it the egg, the sperm? Well, uh, according to this study, in 70 to 80 percent of the cases, it was the egg. Uh, in 10 to 15 percent of the cases, it is the sperm. And um, in 10 to 15 percent, uh, the the causes rely on the endometrium. And today we are talking about this 10 to 50 percent, which are the endometrial causes for implantation failure, knowing that in 85 to 90 percent, the problem is not the endometrium, is the embryo, okay? Obviously, for example, the sperm can play a role even before, so before the formation of the embryo, but also afterwards. Because uh, or in some situations of, uh, of sperm problems, the risk of, um, of miscarriage is, is increased. Okay, so it's, um, it's a little bit like this. So just going back to what I was saying, we're talking about the endometrium today. The, the endometrium is this tissue that coats the inside of the uterus, but this is only responsible for 10 to 15% of the implantation failure situations. According to these statistics, obviously, we, know, we don't know. There is no consensus also uh, about this. Um, just to go uh, a little bit on what I was saying, uh, obviously, when the problem is uh, with the embryos, we're talking essentially about chromosomal abnormalities. And when the problem relies on the uterus, we can have a, a problem in the endometrium, which is the topic for tonight. Uh, and um, 
so and then we have the window replantation, the endometrial receptivity issues, uh, but we also have anatomical abnormalities, uh, immune factors, things that are not directly related with the with the endometrium, but rather with the uterus and uh, some some malformations and so on. So a little bit just to to explain on the on the embryo side, because it's also important to to have in mind that when we are addressing a topic that concerns 10 to 15 percent of the cases, it's important to say that we're typically only co concentrating on the endometrium after we exclude the problems with the embryos, because 85 percent of the time, that uh, 85 to 90 percent of the times, this is where the problems are. And so the main way for us to exclude problems with the embryos is by analyzing genetically the embryos with the pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidies, the PGTA. What are aneuploidies? These are numerical chromosomal abnormalities. This means that your endometrium has your embryo sorry, has the wrong number of chromosomes. Either it has one chromosome, one extra chromosome, the most well-known uh, case is uh, trisomy 21, Down syndrome, where we have three chromosome 21s. Uh, we all know cases like that. Uh, and obviously there could be missing a chromosome or among other factors. And so, and the problem is that these situations are typically age-related. What does it mean? Uh, it means that with the progression of female age, uh, so this is connected with the female age uh, on a very, on a significant minor degree with male age, but uh, essentially it's with female age, uh, we know that with the progression of female age, the type, this type of uh, chromosomal abnormalities increases. And obviously that causes the embryos to be, uh, to carry uh, anomalies and so they are, that are not compatible either with implantation or either with uh, having a, a healthy baby. For example, these are some statistics that uh, these were taken from the iGenomics website. iGenomics is one of the main labs in these fields of reproductive genetics. And we can see here on the gray bars, it's kind of gray bluish bars, that uh, for example, for all ranges uh, for all cl age classes, the probability of pregnancy with PGTA, meaning screening the embryos for chromosomal abnormalities, are pretty much the same. There is a slightly difference. However, if we look at the orange bars, in a non-selected population, pregnancy rate is go down with, uh, with the progression of age. Why does this happen? Because obviously in the gray uh, in the gray bars, we're just considering the transfer of uh, embryos that have the, a normal number of, um, of chromosomes. But um, so PGTA doesn't improve the quality of the embryos. Okay, if an embryo is not good, uh, this is not what changes the embryo. It just helps us to understand what's happening. And uh, it tells us whether the embryo is uh, viable or not and uh, and that helps us to make decisions to to focus our clinical investigations to try to understand why treatments are not working in the endometrium and in other factors uh, so this is kind of the first step to study the endometrium is to understand whether the embryo is viable because you can see here that even for the best possible cases where the patient is below 35 years of age, where we are transferring an embryo with an, the correct number of chromosomes, pregnancy rates are never above 60%, okay? This means that in the remaining 40%, we have the other case, the other causes of uh, implantation failure, okay? And this is where the endometrium lies, and obviously there could be other factors, but this is probably the uterus is is on the missing part of this graphic, the the pregnancy rate that goes from sixty to one hundred. So nature give, brings us until here, but uh, the endometrium is kind of preventing us to reach here because the embryo is supposedly normal uh, in this part. 
Okay, uh, and then we can see the same situation in terms of miscarriage rates. The, on the right hand side, this is sort of the explanation for the left hand graphic. You can see here that in the orange bars that the probability of the miscarriage increases a lot when we are transferring, transferring in an unselected population, while at the, in a selected population where we're just transferring normal embryos, pregnancy rates are, uh, miscarriage rates are pretty much the same. There's a slight increase associated with age, and those are, again, probably endometrial factors, but it's relatively steady on the, on the gray bars um, with age when we transfer good-looking embryos. So, going back and just to say it one more time, uh, when we are addressing the quality of the endometrium and, make, and talking about the relationship between repeated implantation failure and the quality of the endometrium, the first thing that we need to exclude is whether the problem wasn't in the embryo, because we know that the probability of the problem being in the endometrium is relatively low. It's like 10 to 15 percent, as shown in the previous slide. So, uh, let's say we are transferring good quality embryos, nice blastocysts, or maybe PGTA tested embryos, and we're still not getting a pregnancy after those three attempts or uh, after the transfer of four embryos uh, for nice blastocysts. So, what can we do about it? So, let's try to, to exclude the problems with the uterus. Uh, one of the first, well, in the in recent years, uh, this is this was kind of launched it, uh, 10 years ago. One of the, the tests that was most used around the, the world was the endometrial receptivity uh, test that is called the ERA test. Um, we, I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I, I was moving a little too fast. So we need to address the endometrial receptivity and that has three parts. One of them is the window of implantation, another one is the microbiome, and the third is the, the assessing whether there is any, there are any signs of uh, chronic infections in the uterus, uh, what we call uh, chronic endometritis. Um, so, talking about the window of implantation, the endometrial receptivity array, the ERA test, there are other brands doing the same, what is this? This is about the, the window of implantation. This is also another graphic from iGenomics. Uh, just for you to understand the principle, in a normal cycle, in a physiological cycle, we know that uh, the cycle starts on day one, we have the ovulation around day 14, and then uh, on, between day 19 and day 21 is when the endometrium is ready to receive an implanted embryo. Okay, so this is what we call the window of implantation, where the endometrium is ready to receive a blastocyst, which is a day five uh, embryo, and we know that before this, the endometrium is pre-receptive, and after this, the endometrium is post-receptive. Why is that the endometrium being uh, receptive? It means that the endometrium starts to be under the action of an hormone called progesterone. It's, it starts to be more vascularized and ready to receive, implant, and nourish uh, an embryo. So, um, obviously, the window of implantation sometimes is not the same for all women, uh, and 30% uh, of the patients have a displaced window of implantation, according to, to studies that have been made. And so what happens, this is also a graphic from my genomics, is that um, when you transfer an embryo, uh, a day five blastocyst, it needs to be within the window of implantation. Uh, and uh, this window of implantation can be corrected uh, if, uh, if, for example, the, the I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the endometrium is on a receptive letter or earlier. And so we need to adapt the moment where we will transfer the embryo. Why? Because we know that the endometrium needs to be ready to receive the embryo. So if it is a blastocyst, it should be at five days of progesterone, because that's when 
the endometrium is ready to receive a day five blastocyst. However, we know that in some cases, uh, the, the endometrium uh, at, after seven is only ready to receive uh, an implant, an embryo after, after, for example, six or seven or eight days of progesterone, or the opposite, after three or four days, it is already ready. Um, with uh, day three embryos, nor nowadays almost no one is using this but back in like 10 years ago or whatever seven eight years ago we were still doing some cases of day three embryos it's the same logic it just happens uh, two days before okay so um and, and obviously when we are outside the window of, the, of implantation the chances of having a pregnancy are lower the risks of miscarriage are higher and we and there is a risk of us wasting precious viable embryos for transferring them in the in the bad moment uh, how can we correct this it's actually uh, relatively easy we do uh, uh, we prepare the First of all, we do a cycle preparation, like if we were doing a frozen embryo transfer, exactly the same way, except that uh, on the day of the embryo transfer, we will do, um, on the day of the embryo transfer, instead of doing the embryo transfer, we take a, a little piece of the of the endometrium, of the, and that goes to be analyzed uh, on a genetic slot. Uh, they they run a panel for 248 genes, and the result will be one of these. And the, the endometrium is receptive, and we know that. So since we did the biopsy at 120 hours of progesterone, we know that at that very moment the endometrium uh, is ready to to receive an embryo, or uh, for example, the endometrium is still pre-receptive. This means that, uh, for example, this is an example of a, of a real case where uh, the, they recommend that the embryo transfer should be done a day later than the moment where the biopsy was taken. Uh, what does it mean? It, uh, it means that we should transfer a day five embryo to a day six uh, endometrium, okay? Because this patient this particular patient needed an extra days to have her endometrium ready to receive an implant and embryo. Okay, sometimes when the results are not conclusive, we need to take another biopsy. Uh, but the most important thing here is that we need to find what is the best moment to, to do the embryo transfer. And it doesn't require special medication or nothing uh, special. It's really just having an embryo uh, transferred in the right moment for, to optimize the uterine conditions. Uh, according to iGenomics, this is obviously a study made by one of the main labs producing these tests. So like I was saying, 30% of the patients uh, have um, problems in the window of, in, uh, of implantation. So. Uh, Patients with repeated implant implantation failure, so patients within the conditions that we've established in the beginning after at least three failed attempts. And so doing this, uh, doing this particular test on those patients produced better results. Transferring on the day that is supposed to be done 54% of pregnancy, uh, Using this information, they moved to 70, uh, they gained 18% uh, of pregnancy, and uh, the cumulative rate went from 70 to 95%. Um, and obviously, the time for a pregnancy was also reduced because 71% of the women, of all women, uh, gave birth within one year. Uh, this is um, obviously. Uh, these are the results of a study made in certain very specific conditions. Okay, then there was um, there were studies done in a larger scale where they were doing this test to all patients regardless of their conditions, and that the test proved to be um, useless. Okay, so uh, these results were actually challenged. This means that. Uh, 
this is now my opinion and uh, obviously not just mine a lot of people <laughs> share this view so we can't do day tests to everybody because it makes no sense we would be doing biopsies that are useless and for some patients this is not a factor however for patients that have a documented repeated implantation failure case, uh, there there is some beneficial in doing this test. This needs to be looked at uh, with caution. Uh, it's up to the to the IVF specialist to take a look at it and decide whether it makes sense for the patients to do this test or not. Uh, this is not a, a magical bullet that will solve the problem okay uh, it's uh, it's just another tool for us to have a better understanding on how we can optimize the results uh, and it will only work on a restricted number of patients obviously patients that have um, that have been um, subject to to to, to, see, to a series of um, uh, repeated implantation further uh, events in the past. Um, another thing that we all, all that we look at, and this is something that is a lot more consensual than the ERA test and the window of implantation test, is the microbiome and chronic endometritis. What is this all about? So even though in the past, until a few years ago, uh, medicine uh, uh, doctors believed that the uterus was sterile uh, it was proved that in fact there are bacteria inside the womb obviously these need to be the right bacteria okay so this the, we call the microbiome then to the kind of the environment of bacteria that exist inside the womb and we know that this need to be at least 80% lactobacillus okay what does it mean uh, it means that we need to have the right bacteria inside the uterus to prevent the wrong bacteria the pathogenic bacteria to implant and uh, and create an infection or a local reaction and so on because we know that the balanced microbiome with at least 80% lactobacillus uh, will improve your reproductive prognosis, um, obviously resulting in, um, in, in, a, in an increased chance of pregnancy and live births. Uh, we, we've seen in many studies that have been done in recent years that 30% of all infertile women have pathogenic bacteria in their uterus. Um, and so, and there are, numerous studies that show that having pathogenic bacteria and, uh, and other, uh, and, and so not the, the right bacteria, let's put it this way, uh, is very linked to, to embryo implantation failure. So what we do is this, when we, we do exactly the same as before, so we do uh, as an artificial cycle, it can also be done on a natural cycle, but so we do um, an endometrium preparation cycle, but on the day where we should be doing the embryo transfer, instead of doing the embryo transfer, we will just do an endometrium biopsy. So we take a little piece of the endometrium and we send it to be uh, analyzed on a genetic slab. Um, in the, we can use that piece to, do the, to check for the 248 genes related with the window of implantation that we've just discussed, but we can also check for, to see what bacteria are in there. And so, uh, for example, we work with our genomics in these two cases, but again, there are other labs doing pretty much the same. And so we use a test to see um, to, to have a view of the endometrial microbiome uh, composition, okay, and see if we have the right percentage of lactobacilli, and then uh, we can see uh, uh, we also use another use another test that is called in this case a list, but there are others uh, to see uh, if there are. Um, bacteria associated with a chronic endometritis and obviously from that from 
those results, we get a recommendation on what is the, the antibiotic that we should be using. For example, this is also a, a real case from a, a real patient where we had the result was a mild dysbiosis profile. Um, and, uh, and so there was a problem here because we can see that lactobacilli were just 59 instead of 80%, but there were no, uh, uh, no pathogenic bacteria involved. So they didn't find out any of this. So what we have done here was just to give probiotics to the patient. Uh, Sometimes we give the probiotics and we do another biopsy to confirm it, sometimes not. For example, in this case, we did not do that because it was a, a mild change, so it was not a, a very significant case, but we've had cases where the percentage of lactobacillus, of lactobacillus was 0%. Okay, that happened, and in those cases, we we do we we give the antibiotic just to kill uh, potentially harmful bacteria, and then we give the probiotic to populate the uterus with the right bacteria, and then we check again to make sure that everything is fine, and then we move on with the with the embryo transfer. So sometimes we do it in one way, sometimes we do it in another way. It has to do with the specific case of. Um, uh, of each patient, there is not a universal solution uh, for every patient uh, that we can say we need, we always need to do it like that. Another thing that uh, we should uh, that 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 we should check while evaluating the uterus, not in this case, this is not specific for the endometrium, but we're talking about uh, anatomical abnormalities. So what is that? Well, there is a, a, an ex a test, an exam called hysteroscopy, where we go with a video camera to see the inside of the wound. And this is used to check for polyps, to check for endometritis, because we can also do a biopsy along, to check for myomas, also known as fibroids, adhesions, aden adenomyosis, malformations, etc. Obviously, some of these can be surgically corrected, um, some don't, and I'm treated with, treat with antibiotics, as I've explained. Um, so, we need to take a look. Obviously, for example, uh, we know that, uh, uh, for example, this is a study that showed that uh, congenital uterine abnormalities can lower the reproductive outcome, so there's no discussion around it. This, there is consensus about it. However, for example, uh, there are surgeries that make sense and some others don't make sense. For example, in this review from uh, the Cochrane Library, this is um, this is kind of a of a specialist committee sponsored by the World Health Organization. Uh, for example, they say that, for example, in women that have septum, there is no evidence the, to to support the surgical procedure in these women. So they they say that it's preferable not to remove the septum because it's a surgery, it's aggressive, uh, it can actually do worse than not re to remove it. Obviously, if we do, if a patient has repeated the miscarriage or repeated implantation failure, we can look at it in another way. But uh, in as a first approach, for example, so surgeries are not always recommended. That's the, the take-home message here. Um, there is also something that is always very discussed and now we are talking. So remember when I started this, I showed you a slide saying that the problems with the uterus represent 10 to 15 percent of all cases. And now we are on those 10 to 15 percent uh, percentage, we are talking about uh, small pieces of those 10 to 15 percent. And this is probably the smallest of all of these pieces, the immune and dermatological tests. There is a lot uh, of, there are a lot of tests in the market. There are people, uh, I mean, tests for NK cells. In France, for example, there's a test called uh, Matrice Lab, where they test for the immunitary, uh, the immune environment at the uterine level. There are a lot of uh, people testing for CIR, HLA, uh, C, um, there are panels that screen for autoimmune diseases, the screening panels for thrombophilia, 
I mean, there is a lot of stuff. Not all of this is proven. Actually, most of this is not proven because in order to prove the effect of this um, uh, benefit of doing these tests and correcting for these factors, you will need to do large scale studies, which are extremely difficult to do, not only for financial reasons, but also because you would need to find a uh, large number of patients exactly with the same problems. And it's very difficult to find a sample because in, in IVF, there is always a lot of factors it's the egg it's the sperm it's uh, you know it's uh, every patient is a single case and so it is very very difficult to gather a number of patients where they are all alike except for the fact that they might or not uh, or might not have a problem with a, an autoimmune disease or uh, because they are cure a or hla hla mm, C1, etc. So this is something not none of this is completely proven. Uh, we also do do this, okay? No, no, no question about it. Um, from this, the one that uh, we rely more is the care HLA. We're doing that a lot, and uh, we've seen a lot of cases where, after correcting for these factors, it was possible to have the birth of uh, health, healthy children and people having healthy pregnancies. Uh, this is sometimes a little painful because it takes a while for patients to get, especially when working with donors, when there are no donors involved, we need to give to the patient special protocols to the patient. So there is a lot to be done. Uh, uh, but uh, obviously, it's not. It's part of our uh, reality. Uh, I would. Um, I was hesitating before talking about uh, protocols here, but uh, I preferred not to do it because again, patients are all different, and these uh, protocols need to be personal. This is not something. Uh, it's not a one size fits all kind of case. It's something that we really need to, to assess on a. Um, on a patient basis, okay? Uh, because uh, obviously at the end of the day, what we want is this to happen. This is a blastocyst implanting in the uterus. Um, and, uh, uh, and so that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm also, because in a, in a previous presentation on this topic, I was asked to show some examples of real life cases. Uh, and I decided to, to bring them back because they, these are obviously all fake names, uh, but these are real cases that we had at Fertility Center. For example, in the case of Janet, this is a 42 year old lady with five years of infertility, two previous miscarriages. She had multiple Multiple fibroids uh, that were surgically removed by laparoscopy. She had the, them removed before coming to our clinic. Uh, she presented with a low ovarian reserve, uh, so we did her an egg accumulation. So we did her two stimulations. Uh, the first one just to freeze her eggs. The second one to 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 get more eggs and then we did uh, we did the IVF with the frozen the previous frozen eggs plus the fresh ones we ended up having one blastocyst with PGTA preimplantation genetic testing and the embryo turned out to be aneuploid meaning it was not viable so um, we had to discard that embryo, and then we we did uh, an egg donation treatment. Uh, we had um, three blastocysts, all of them turned out to be aneuploid again, uh, which was uh, kind of strange. We were not sure whether this could come from her or the husband. Uh, so we tried again and uh, without any uh, plausible or evident explanation, anything but luck. So we ended up with six blastocysts, uh, five of them were uh, euploid. So, uh, Problem solved. We transferred the first embryo. Uh, well, actually, not right away. So we transferred the first embryo, and the result was negative. And then we did the ERA test, and we 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 verified that the endometrium was only receptive at 144 hours. So there was a 24 hours delay. Uh, we also did a thrombophilia panel. 
there were multiple positive results. So this patient had a lot of issues. We referred her to an hematologist. Um, the hematologist put her on an individualized prophylactic protocol for these thrombophilia factors. And then uh, finally, she had a pregnancy with the birth of a baby boy. Um, so this uh, was the, the end of this case. We also have another case, Pauline, 30 years old, two miscarriages already, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, also a male, uh, a male factor. This patient didn't want PGTA, okay, because when we have uh, two previous miscarriages, there is a clear indication for uh, uh, for PGTA. It's also one of the situations where we don't need approval uh, for that because uh, the indication is very clear. So we did an ovarian stimulation that went really well. Despite the male factor, we ended up with six nice blastocysts. We froze them all. Um, and so we transferred the first one and uh, we had another miscarriage, which was the patient's third miscarriage. And then we transferred the second embryo, another nice blastocyst, and the result was negative. So um, what we did was uh, we asked her to do lifestyle corrections because this patient was a little bit in overweight. Um, we... This was back in the days before we were doing these Emma and Alice tests. Uh, so we did uh, probiotics and, TB and antibiotics prophylaxis. Uh, we gave her a night dosage uh, progesterone protocol because we, we ended up checking for her progesterone and the levels were not very stable. And then it was another healthy boy that was born uh, after, uh, after all of this. Again, this is uh, something that shows up that we really need to, to take a look at what's happening with the patient. This is another case, Natalie, uh, she, is, uh, she was 44 years old, low ovarian reserve, uh, egg donation cycle. We ended up uh, with four blastocysts, which is normal for an egg donation case. We did uh, an elective single embryo transfer cycle uh, and the result was negative. We did a second cycle, the result was negative again. And then we need uh, we did the, the te we tested her for the window of implantation and also for and also for the um, the the microbiome and the, the chronic endometritis. So first of all, receptiveness only at 146 hours, uh, and with and only 26 percent of lactobacilli. Okay, so this means that there was a dysbiosis. Um, we we screened her for immune factors, and uh, uh, we found uh, we accidentally found out that she was a carrier of uh, an autoimmune disease. The patient was not aware of that. Um, she she was also a carrier of, of a factor five mutation on the thrombophilia screening. So what we did then, obviously, we were working with the, the doctors from endocrinology uh, for the other diseases, and then we did uh, a third protocol following the very the same protocol that was done uh, with the IRA test, with probiotics, with the antibiotics according to recommendations that we got from. Uh, from my genomics, uh, we worked with the endocrinologist and the hematologist for the thrombophilia and autoimmune diseases. They've, we've adjusted the protocol according to their recommendation as well, and the treatment finally worked at embryo transfer number three. So this is the third best embryo, okay, because we always started with the one that looked better and then the second one, and it was only on the third that we got uh, success also after correcting all of this. Was this really the endometrium or we, were we just lucky because we've maybe only transferred the best embryo uh, on the third embry embryo transfer? We will never know, okay? We, in principle, there are objective reasons for us to believe that it made sense, all of these corrections. So we don't think this was a coincidence, but obviously we don't have any proof of that. And this is uh, kind of a testament of how it works. So we need to 
check, we need to evaluate, we need to make decisions on what we've seen. Uh, again, it's not a, a one case fits all situation. We have multiple uh, multiple situations that can happen, uh, but we are here, and this is why. Uh, this is why we are. We go to work every day. Uh, if you need more information, you can find us online. I'm very happy to answer questions. And so I'm passing the words back to you, Caroline. And um, I'm, I'm available to, to answer all the questions. Thank you so much indeed. As always, an interesting presentation with lots of details, but uh, we are ready for your for your questions. So remember to type those in the chat. All is anonymous, so don't hesitate. Vladimir Euro is right here for you to answer them. And let's go. We have some questions ready, actually. So let me go to the first question. So I have endometriosis, but my uterus and endometrium is okay. How thick must the endometrium be before IVF? Thank you for your first question. Okay, actually, I should have mentioned this. It was because I was focusing a lot more on the on the tests. But um, so, um, first thing, uh, endometriosis is when you have endometrium growing outside the uterus, okay? The endometrium is the tissue that coats the inside of the uterus, so it should be inside the uterus, not outside the uterus. Uh, and, and when it, uh, it grows outside the uterus, um, uh, I'm sorry, are you, because I, I'm having some uh, warnings that my internet connection is not okay, but it's We fine. can hear you. We can hear you fine, so it's all okay. Okay, okay good. So, um, so endometriosis has nothing to do with the quality of the endometrium here. Uh, so you don't need to worry about that if that's the case. Um, so regarding the, the thickness of the endometrium, the ideal is that the endometrium is above eight millimeters of thickness. Um, above seven is already okay. Um, Above six, it's uh, um, we have pregnancies. Below six, we also have pregnancies, but these are more difficult. Okay, so normally what we say, we always try to get eight. Okay, and if we don't get eight, we prefer to start over and try a different protocol, a different approach. If after some attempts, we don't get to at least eight millimeters, we will see and we will work with what we have. Uh, obviously, sometimes we work, we use uh, PRP, growth factors, etc. These are also strategies that are not completely proven, uh, but we, we actually have some good results with them. Um, but this is normally what we say is that those are for sort of more desperate cases when the traditional proven therapies are not working, then we can start uh, trying things that are still more experimental to, to see if we can get results. Um, but okay. obviously we, we had children born from 5.8, 5.6 endometrium. Obviously that doesn't happen every day. Uh, but so we always aim for eight millimeters. Okay. Thank you for your first explanation and your question indeed. And let's have a look next question. Uh, endotrio test came back normal. Endometrium always looks perfect. Three failures with PGT tested, five failures altogether. I tried immunology treatments too with no success. Previously naturally conceived the pregnancy. What are my options? Well, this is a, a difficult case. Okay, so um, the problem with this case uh, from this patient uh, is that uh, she did uh, endo trio test. What does it mean? So those are the tests that I was talking about, uh, where they test for the window of implantation, the microbiome, and the chronic endometritis. And the endometrium apparently was okay. Uh, she says also that the endometrium uh, also looks perfect, always looked perfect. So probably she's talking about the thickness of the endometrium. Then three failures with PGT tested embryos. Um, it's uh, I would go for those very rare cases of, um, for example, one of the things that we would definitely try in this case was the test for the gear uh, compatibility. Uh, normally, uh, for example, uh, 
uh, this is kind of complex, but in the uterus, there are some genes called the Kier genes, and in the embryo, there are other genes that are called the HLAC genes. And so we need, when the profile, the genetic profile of the uterus is Kier A, there could be a problem of compatibility if the embryo is HLA-C2, okay? And, um, and obviously, we receive a C, uh, an HLA-C from our father and an HLA-C from our mother. And so while forming the embryo, uh, the embryo can be C1-C1, C1-C2, and C2-C2. If the embryo is C2-C2 and the uterus is here A, there is a risk of implantation failure, miscarriage, preeclampsia, lots of problems during the pregnancy. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it's a complicated situation. There's, I mean, there are protocols that we can use with steroids, with growth factors and so on, that can help us to, uh, with aspirin, uh, that can help us to control uh, for that risk, but it's not the ideal. In some situations, uh, we, can, we need to involve donors uh, in order to, to solve the, the problem. Uh, I actually had a, we had a, at Verti Centro a case very similar to this one. Uh, this patient uh, was, she had on top of all of these six miscarriages and, um, and we've tried everything with her. And actually it only worked when we did double donation. Uh, we never, I mean, we transferred her, PGT tested embryos, we did her, the kids, I mean, we did her everything you can imagine and something else, <laughs> okay? Because not just us, because she was already being uh, moving from clinic to clinic, uh, she was she had uh, maybe ten years or so, uh, and and so we ended up doing double donation, and that's when it worked. Actually, the child was recently born, um, and um, and the only explanation that we can think of is probably some immune factor that was never found uh, that was solved by replacing one of the gametes involved, meaning uh, the egg and the sperm. And we worked with two donors that had a good pregnancy record uh, in the past. So that's when we did it. So the good message from this case is that even for the apparently worst prognosis cases, there could be hope. Uh, in this situation, we need we would need to take a look because this patient also had a, a natural pregnancy, which is kind of even more strange. Uh, sometimes these immune problems are triggered by a first pregnancy and they develop immune, immune reaction, re, immune rejection for a second pregnancy. That can happen, obviously, um, but uh, I really don't know what, I mean, we would need to take a look uh, and study it. That makes perfect sense, obviously. So thank you so much. And I believe that helped you. And Emily has a question regarding NK cells. So are NK cell tests for LAT better than uterine NK cells, uh, cell biopsy? Uh, I'm sorry, let me see. Are NK cells for blood better than uterine? <laughs> it's very difficult to answer this question. Um, so, first question, first uh, answer, we don't know, okay? Uh, if I had to choose, I would prefer to rely on the results from uterine NK cells. Apparently, those are more related with uh, the cases of... Uh, immune rejection at the uterine level, but the reality is that, uh, for example, the, this is not proven, okay? Uh, the, this is one of those tests that, uh, that, is still, uh, that still needs to have larger studies, large-scale studies to, to prove. A lot of doctors and clinics uh, are trying, are, working and making decisions based on that but it's uh, it's, it's what i was telling the, during my present my presentation it's like the desperation stage you know when everything is apparently okay we don't know where else to look and so we try for um, to solve this to work with these things that are not completely proven so none of them is proven if i had to choose i would go 
with the ones inside the uterus, those seem more important, but the reality is that there are no, uh, there is no consensus and no good quality studies showing that this is definitely something that we should be looking at. Okay, and now let me go to the previous question from Emily, the same patient. So would you expect the bacteria in the uterus to mirror what is found in the rest of the vagina? Uh, a very good question, uh, but in th theory, uh, I mean, there I've seen uh, people saying this and also the opposite, okay? Um, in principle, uh, it, it shouldn't be the same, okay, because the uterus uh, is normally... Uh, is normally a closed cavity. Obviously, there is an entrance, but um, it it shouldn't be the same. And uh, and and also, the bacteria in the uterus are the most important ones. The the ones inside the uterus are the most important ones for the implantation process. So checking just what happens in the vagina is not enough for us to know what happens inside the uterus. Okay, probably, but uh, the question can be asked in a different way. Is whether, okay, if I have a chronic endometritis, will this affect, will this be present in the vagina? Yes, there is that risk, okay? Uh, but the fact that there's nothing in the vagina doesn't mean that it can happen inside the uterus. Okay, so, Different issues. We need to check to always check the, the inside of the uterus if we wanna if we really want to exclude this factor. We can't skip that. Otherwise, it would be easier. Okay. <laughs> Thank you okay. so much once more for answering two more questions. And let me just go to the next question. We will go back to the first, not first question, but the previous ones. Okay. So are there lifestyle changes that may enhance the success of implantation in cases of repeated failure well if that was that easy okay uh, obviously there are things that you can do uh, for example uh, normally we always say the healthier you are the less likely you are to suffer from infertility uh, and so for example if you are a smoker if you are a drinker if you do drugs okay these are very easy to fix lifestyle changes um, and this will certainly increase your chances of implantation then uh, there is uh, for example uh, almost sustain uh, if you if you take the the correct amount of folic acid and if you do a, a good a well balanced diet you will have it in your vegetables and so on uh, then you you don't have problems at that level that are associated with thrombophilia uh, obviously if you go to, if you eat fast food every day, uh, you will have problems at various levels. And so this is obviously uh, also causing problems at the, the little veins that do the microcirculation in the uterus and so on. So um, there are, uh, for example, uh, we work with a, with a company in Switzerland, they are called ART Fertilité, and what they do, they, they have nutritionists working for them, they correct lifestyle of the patient, they, they balance the nutrition, they have nutrition programs, and the, the reality is that we're getting very good results. We have patients that got pregnant after doing these programs that were having very negative results before that um, and so i would say yes until a certain degree okay if the problem is genetic is with the embryo there i mean you can have you can be the healthiest person on earth but if you're not putting a healthy embryo inside your womb it will not implant so what we can do is kind of optimize all the factors that we can control and lifestyle is definitely one of them so um, i would say uh, definitely let's control everything that we can control and uh, and leave the rest to, to medicine okay thank you so much indeed once more there are three more questions and after that we will be finishing so if you have more questions go ahead type those in right now and mm -hmm. i will go to the next question so which autoimmune disease 
diseases can affect the receptivity of the endometrium? Uh, I'm most of them. Okay, so autoimmune diseases are uh, there are a lot of them. Okay, they they affect uh, different systems in your body, but what uh, and the reality what we know is that people that have autoimmune conditions typically have a higher risk of rejecting an embryo. Um, this is, so we when we do those panels to, again. We're talking about the things that are not completely proven, okay? But when we do the panels to check for um, uh, immune hyperreactivity uh, to uh, in in cases of repeated implantation failure, we get a lot of anti-nuclear antibodies positive, uh, anti-thyroid hormones positive. I mean, uh, those are maybe the most common. Um, so, for example thyroiditis is one of them. Uh, so we know that uh, there is an association. It's very hard to quantify. What we do is we try to regulate it with steroids, with medication to suppress the, that hyper, that immune hyper reaction. But again, this is not proven. It, this, these are the things that we do that we try to control when there is nothing else that we can do. Okay, A little bit like that other patient over the in the beginning, she apparently everything was fine. She the endometrium was fine. She did the most important tests and everything looked fine. So uh, if if she was with us, what we would be doing is to check for these autoimmune diseases, to check for. Uh, I, I remember, for example, I can tell you a story of a patient because these patients were actually personal friends of mine. Uh, we knew each other since we were three years old, both of us. Uh, so we've known each other for, for all of our lives and uh, uh, they came to, to the clinic as patients. And, uh, and I remember that um, we did an ectonation treatment, we transferred two very good embryos and uh, in two embryo transfers and no pregnancy after both of the, those transfers. And they had another four embryos, I think, uh, and they said, well, uh, they, they've registered in the public service. Uh, they were also being followed over there in the public service in Portugal uh, to, to in the endocrinology service. So they were followed by them. And, and then a year and a half later, they came back to the clinic and said, well, uh, we were lucky enough because one of the endocrinologists in the public hospital got interested in our case and she ran all the tests that you can imagine and ended up diagnosing a disease that I never heard before, an extremely rare uh, autoimmune disease. Uh, she treated that patient for that. Uh, she was saying we did, I mean, this was in a public hospital, so it was free for the patient, but uh, the total cost of this test was like 6,000 euros or so, uh, but obviously the patient paid nothing because it was in a public hospital. Um, and so they found out that she was a carrier for, she was, she was affected by this autoimmune disease. They treated her, everything went back to normal, and then she came and when, and she asked us to transfer two embryos and uh, because we were not doing her the, the, her first treatment she has tried elsewhere before and we agreed with that and she immediately got pregnant with twins uh, so this is a, a very clear example uh, of an autoimmune disease that was probably the cause and uh, and we see a lot of that okay so but these are I mean, when I say we see a lot of that, these are rare cases that we see from time to time. These mm -hmm. are not first line uh, situations where we can start checking for all. We do some panels to screen for the most common things, but uh, and we and then we use protocols to try to control for that, but in a sort of prophylactic way. So we're treating things that we don't even know if they are there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of brilliant. Thank you so much for your thorough answer. And um, let's have a look at the next question. So in case of embryo donation, how can I know the quality of the embryo for sure since they are not tested genetically? Uh, 
there are two ways we can test the embryo. <laughs> okay, uh, in some situations it is possible, in some other situations it is not. It depends on the regulation, it will also depend on the story of the embryo and whether we want to warm that embryo, do a biopsy, freeze the embryo again, wait for the result of the biopsy and so on. So normally, uh, I'm now I can only speak for, for ourselves. When we work with embryo donation, we all we only freeze and make available for donation embryos that have good prognosis. This is something that we that we assess based on the quality of the the embryo development. Uh, we we work with uh, with the embryoscope, with video time lapse technology. Nowadays, also with artificial intelligence, we try to understand uh, the real viability of the embryos, and we only freeze embryos in which we believe in. And obviously, sometimes if that's not the case, those embryos would never be available for be, for donation. So. So uh, I would say that, uh, at least with us, there's no such thing as a bad quality embryo being donated because we would never make them available for donation. Uh, obviously, uh, testing the I'm a, I'm very much in favor of preimplantation genetic testing. Okay, this is not uh, a consensual topic in the scientific community. I would say that nowadays it's become more and more. Uh, there is more and more consensus on this, uh, so I'm pretty much in favor of it. So if I was the ruler, <laughs> I would allow PGT for all embryos in all cases. But um, but it, it's not like that, uh, and so we cannot do do it uh, every time. But um, so I would say, ideally, being able to do the PGT would be great. Uh, if that's not possible for regulatory or technical questions, then we should rely on the the embryo morphology and morphokinetics because that's also, uh, that's already very informative. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank of course. You. And now we will go to our final question for today. Uh, so could the very high endometrium thickness cause implantation failure? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, okay. Uh, normally, uh, so at our clinics, we we consider the optimal range to be between eight and sixteen, with sixteen being kind of too much. Okay. So uh, I would um, normally we like it to be. Uh, between 18 and 14, that's uh, the ideal range, uh, because obviously a very high endometrium increases the risk of polyps and other complications. Uh, but if if I was to choose, uh, if we, we were to choose, we prefer to have uh, a, a, a problem of uh, excess uh, endometrium than the opposite, because when we have an endometrium that is growing too fast, we know that i mean it's just a question of fine-tuning the process but we will end up having a good looking regular not too thick endometrium it's just a question of uh, step finding out the right protocol uh, if uh, if the endometrium is always at 4 4.5 and so on uh, it's a lot more difficult to treat so having to choose between the two of them we would prefer the, the endometrium that is too thick but obviously uh, if it is uh, let's say 20 or 18 or something it will uh, it can also cause problems obviously okay thank you so much as i mentioned it uh, was our final question so thanks everyone for all of your questions and for your patience and vladimir as always it's been great to have you and um, lots of uh, interesting questions and uh, before we finish as always i'd like to ask you if there is anything else you wish to add for our uh, ending the session. No, uh, I mean, just uh, to thank you one more time. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, uh, I'm actually, I was just seeing the, 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 the announcement for the next webinar on the 6th. Uh, it should be really interesting as well. So, um, 
I would I just like to, to wish good luck to everyone who was watching this, who is trying to have a baby. I do hope things work for you. If I can help, please, uh, you can send an email or contact through the my IVF, sure. my IVF answers website, and you will direct the questions to us. And uh, once again, good luck and thanks for for watching. Thank you so much. Indeed showed you this so yes we will be back with uh, three different doctors on tuesday so if you haven't uh, signed up yet go ahead do it it's going to be an interesting session no presentation just q a so if you have some questions you can ask there will be three different doctors also dr nisa felix from 30 center will be there as well so we are really looking forward to this event the link is also in the chat but of course if you go to our website myavifenses.com you will find it um, easily as well. So thanks everyone for joining us. As always, it's been great to have you, Vladimiro. And I'm really looking forward to some more events. Take care, everyone. Have a good evening and see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.